this is another exclusive rock music star interview. Conducted by Thomas S. Orwalk Jr. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 25 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwalk Jr. It is June 22nd, 2021, and today I have guitarist songwriter Jeff Coleman as my guest. Jeff Coleman recently released a brand new instrumental solo record entitled East of Heaven. This 14-track release is a true musical masterpiece. In addition to his successful solo career, Jeff is also a member of the classic rock band The Ellen Parsons Project and an instrumental progressive rock band called Cosmo Squad. Jeff also toured as a bass player for UFO and the Michael Shanker Band. And Jeff was a guitarist on the Mogway Chocolate Box release in 1999. We discuss this all in the following exclusive interview. So get ready. Here he is, Jeff Coleman. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode number 25 of the Rock Interview Series. And we have another amazing special guest today. We have none other than guitar superstar Jeff Coleman as our guest. Jeff, how are you today? I'm doing good. Just came back from the bar with my wife after... uh getting my Land Rover fixed, and here we are. Now I'm sobering up with coffee. <laughs> All right. Now, are you calling, you're in um, Los Angeles? You know, we have a house in L.A., but then we bought a house outside of Chicago. Okay. Undisclosed location uh, near the beach. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, you're drinking some coffee pretty late. So, so uh, <laughs> Midwest living, kind of where I grew up. Right. You grew up in uh, Toledo, Ohio. Yep. So that, that's pretty close. So um, you're here as our guest today because I want to talk about your new incredible record called East of Heaven. It's it's all instrumental and it's it's really a fabulous record. I mean, for me personally, instrumental records are kind of hit and miss. I kind of feel that many of them um, are not, I mean, are pretty much the same style and yours has um, a lot of diversity in it which is very pleasing on the ears. If you hear, if you hear the same style over and over again, your ears yeah. kind of get a fatigue from, you know, that, that type of music. So, I mean, your, your record is more like a, a journey, I think. I mean, I, I love listening to it. Like, you know, right before I go to bed, it kind of like, you know, puts me in a good frame of mind. So tell us a little bit about the record and um, when did you start recording it? I started it um, basically at the beginning of the lockdown in March of last year. And um, I didn't really set out to do a new record. I mean, I always want to do a new record, but um, all our touring canceled. And like a lot of people, it's like, okay, what are we doing? Okay, let's, you know, make a record. (laughs) Um, But for me, it was more therapy of just writing songs and having ideas and putting out what I had to get out of my system. And then there's a certain point where you're like halfway through a record and you realize, oh, I'm making a record. So let's see where this goes and kind of put the rest together. And uh, so that was kind of the process. And it's very therapeutic, you know, to um, be, be doing this during the lockdown. And the lockdown has been so tough on so many people, psychologically and you know, financially, emotionally, I've seen couples break up and, you know, a lot of people have left California because of the politics of the state. And, you know, and I, I was living in California at the time and I still have a house there. And um, it was just amazing to be writing and recording and realize this is a blessing more time with my children, more time to garden, more time to sit around and practice, to mix the record, to write, to emote and whatever, you know? So it was amazing, you know? And on a, on a grander scale, you know, I mean, what we've went through in our lifetime, you're probably the same age as me. We haven't went through anything. COVID-19 is nothing compared to and World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam. Come on, you know, this is just a small little segment in the history of the world. And so, t- but to navigate it is important, you know. And people have lost loved ones, and 
it's not to be taken lightly, but um, I really felt um, compelled to be creative and make a record. So, and it kind of reflects, it's not you know, like my favorite, one of my favorite bands, like early Van Halen, everything is just fun loving and, you know, party. I wouldn't say this record is that. <laughs> You know, it's more cinematic, ethereal, um, darker for certain. And, um, you know, it's what I felt at the time. So it's a snapshot of my life in the last year. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I kind of feel like it kind of like sort of like um, brings all of the elements of your playing from over the years all together in one record. So if somebody really wants to know what Jeff Coleman sounds like. This is a great starting point, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, the, the track, uh, So Long Ago, which is an acoustic track. Yeah. Uh, can, can you tell me a little bit about writing that song? I mean, that that's one I keep playing over and over again. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a great, great uh, song. Yeah, you know, that one has this kind of, um, it's very melancholy and peaceful but at the same time it's longing for you know if you live long enough the problem with children is they haven't experienced life yet you know and I kind of experienced a lot of um, family members dying at a younger age and and it reminds me of a, a scene like Al Pacino in um, Carlito's way where he gets out of prison and he goes back to his old stomping grounds and nothing is what it was. It's like the memory of what used to be, you can never actually go back there again. And so the song has a longing for a memory that you have that's so instilled in your heart, but you know, you can't go back there. There's no going back. It could be your mother and your father and your brother and whoever it is in your life an old a dear friend of the past the neighborhood changed everything you go back and like wow so you know i think that song ha has that kind of um emotion in it and with instrumental music without lyrics you know i mean a guy like neil young could say all that in three chords <laughs> and some good lyrics or bob dylan Instrumental music, it's a little more difficult and a little more of a challenge, especially if you don't have the movie cinematic side of it to carry you along, you know. So I think the listener who doesn't listen to instrumental music, you kind of have to close your eyes and really like think about it and go, oh, I get it, you know. Mm -hmm. For instance, I have an uncle that he loves movies and if I had a a song in a scene of a movie, he would only appreciate it then. He's not going to get it. He's like, I don't, uh, there's no lyrics, doesn't sound like Jerry Lee Lewis. I like Elvis, that's it. You know, but he loves movies. And so some people really need to see a visual to get the audio. And um, it's neither here nor there, but um, I think it's a great challenge to creating emotion without lyrics, you know? And when you listen to that song, you can feel a longing for something that used to be that isn't there anymore. If it's peaceful, but at the same time, there's, a, there's this longing and this feeling like you're, you know, your heart is like you're being pulled a little bit. Yeah. And that, that's not very easy to accomplish, like you said, without the lyrics. I mean, you have to be a pretty talented writer to be able to pull that off instrumentally, I feel. I think more than being a talented writer, I think it's being really honest with yourself and um, figuring out a way to use pain and suffering that you go through. Like you, you just told me that before the podcast started that your, your dog had passed away, you had to put your animal down. I mean, there's a song right there. It's just like having a child. And I'm sure that the dog's been with you for years and it's just a part of the family. It's so emotional. And um, 
you know, you can, you can medicate, drink and party and, and that's one way to deal with it. Going off the rails, divorce, womanizing. <laughs> it's all fun. <laughs> but for me, it's always about um, grabbing the instrument because that's what saved me as a kid and emoting through the instrument. So it's really about finding life's hardships and internalizing it and writing a song with it. Yeah. Is it, is it talent? I mean, there's way more talented guitar players than myself with, you know, ability and chops. But I think maybe the advantage that I have is that I can uh, find life's experiences and emote more with it than some great shred guitar player yeah yeah and that's kind of what i was trying to um, allude to earlier of, of the fact that you know there are a lot of instrumental records where they're very they're one trick ponies where like you know i i get it you, you know how to sweep okay but i don't need to listen to it for like 40 minutes you know and, and like i said you have that, that diversity that really makes it a very interesting experience for the listener yeah and, uh, yeah I, I i i really i i really admire this record and for everyone watching, I mean, definitely check it out. I mean, it's one of those. So it's, seriously, you you listen to it like for for the first time, and you like fall in love with it. So I, I just want to say congratulations oh, for for a great record. Um, did you play all the instruments on this um release? Um, none of the drums. Uh huh. Um, uh, much of the bass, except for one song, um, Matkatini Waltz. Right. Paul Chihara, my dear friend who lives in Las Vegas, played the bass on that, and he took a solo on that track. Uh, the drummers are Shane Gallus, who I play with all the time. Yeah. And the other drummer on the record is a gentleman named, by the name of John O'Brown. And he and I do a lot of uh, film and TV. And we used to do a lot of movie trailers together. And that helped me really grow as a, as a player to understand textures in space and um, less is more. And so he's on the title track, uh, East of Heaven and Hidden Dimensions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have Guy Allison on keys on um, 67 XR7. I think it's track seven on the record. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I've played, you know, the other instruments. And yeah. Mainly out of lockdown, you know, COVID. <laughs> like, well, I know how to play the bass. I respect bass players more, but you know, um, you know, just trying to get it done. Right. Uh, now that everything's opening up, do you find yours? Do you see um, yourself possibly going out on the road to promote this record? Well, interesting enough. So I'm I'm the guitar player for Alan Parsons, who's a legendary producer and songwriter and engineer and some of your fans don't know who he is you can just say well he started out with the beatles and then pink floyd dark side of the moon and he had a career with singles you know all day long and um so we're gonna go out in two weeks in spain you know our, our year canceled right when the lockdown hit we canceled everything so but we're going to go out in Spain and do two weeks and then three weeks in the U S. Um, I just played a show two nights ago in LA for my record sold out show. That was great. So, um, I, I definitely want to book some shows playing, uh, you know, the new record and, but it's tricky, you know, it's like now we have this Delta variant and yeah, you know, everybody's opening up really fast. I saw that Foo Fighters at Madison Square Garden. How many people are there? We'll see the effect of that. I, I'm positive, but at the same time, you know, everybody's been locked down for so long that there has to be a little bit, bit of a backlash. Yeah, it, it is kind of strange how fast everything's opening up. Um, for instance, they just announced today in Buffalo that there's going to be a Billy Joel stadium show. Uh, in August, which is like, and it's going to be hundred percent capacity, yeah. which is like, wow. I mean, and, and some, some are, some um, artists, like for instance, you know, the Goo Goo Dolls, they canceled their tour for 2021 matchbox 20 did the uh, stadium tour was canceled, but others, 
you know, the same day when they were canceling, others, other, other artists were announcing like 100 date shows in 2021. So it's, you know, I understand that there are people that need to get back out to work, but, you know, it, it just seemed like it, once the floodgates opened, man, did they open up? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a whole nother subject. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it, it the vaccine, not getting the vaccine, uh, the effects of the vaccine. Should children get inoculated? What it does to pregnant women? The government is suppressing the information. It's, you know, it's a whole yeah. thing. Yeah. We could have many podcasts just on that alone. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll kind of... somewhere down the middle. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you can tell when the government's, you know, pushing for something and suppressing things. And there's other, uh, you know, methods that have worked to deal with COVID, like ivermectin, but they, you know, they push that away because, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, there's a lot of money to be made. Yeah. So, it's tricky, you know, and, mm -hmm. and everybody's sensitive. I mean, in my lifetime, it's like, you know, uh, with Black Lives Matter and the left versus the right and the far left versus the far right. It's like, oh my God, can we just dog it along? I feel like everything we've accomplished since Martin Luther King it's just been thrown in the garbage can and now we've got to start over and it's worse than it ever was. Yeah. Basically, if you're white, you're a fucking, you know, white supremacist. And it's like, what happened? It was going so great. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but again, there's a lot of money to be made for people stirring the pot. And, you know, I mean, I, we don't need to get into all that, but, you know, Yes, I have family members that are German and Irish. Am I a Nazi? No. Do I own a My Pillow by Mike Lindell? Yes. Does that make me a Nazi? No. <laughs> you know, my heroes are black men. Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, you know, I can Walter Payton. Let's get over it and move on. Absolutely. You know, I people that are more. trying to segregate everybody. It's, it's uh, you know, people have an agenda now and it's getting weird with the shot, with uh, Black Lives Matter, with, you know, it's getting, so it's, it's a weird time. So anyway, yeah. back to music. Yeah, back to music. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So um, Alan Parsons project, you said you're going to be doing American, uh, some dates in America. Yeah. Um, had, had those been announced yet? Yeah. Uh, they have okay. starting in LA September 27th and you know we have random shows all over the country um play Minneapolis we play the Ryman Theater we go down in Atlanta I think there's two shows in Florida there's a North Carolina show we're playing Ojai a random you know gig in California so wonderful yeah you played on a, a 1999 release um called mog way which had phil mog and p way of ufo yeah um, and paul it. raymond oh paul paul was also yeah that's right paul was also on that that's right uh can you just tell me a little bit about what that experience was like for you your, your, the record you recorded was called chocolate box yeah the funny thing was i was on tour with michael shanker it was g3 and it was uh i want to say 1998 or 97 and I just moved from Toledo, Ohio to Phoenix and moved to LA and got that gig doing a five week tour. And Uli John Roth was on the tour and Michael Schenker and Joe Satriani, who kind of owns the brand of the G3. And so we did five weeks. And when I got, when I got home, um, I got a call to audition for Phil Mogg from UFO. And I thought, well, this has to be related to Michael. And they had no idea I just played with Michael, which is crazy because, you know, Michael Schenker, UFO, it's like synonymous. And, um, and so I met with Phil in Laurel Canyon. He was staying at his manager's place, Bill Olson. And, you know, he called me and instead of auditioning, I thought I would just write a couple songs that I thought he could kind of vibe to. 
And I would recommend, you know, a younger musician that's maybe watching the podcast on the road. That's kind of a good way, you know, if they were going to audition for one of their heroes or anybody, instead of just like performing a guitar solo in front of them or singing or whatever, it's kind of awkward. You know, songwriting is an important element of, you know, um, staple of what, what we can relate to. So... I wrote a song that was very much like Mother Mary and another song called um, Mighty's Gold. And Phil latched on right away and said, oh, I can write lyrics to that. Okay, let's do this. You know, I gave him a cassette. We listened to it. Bill Wilson's house. That kind of solidified the deal. So, and at that point, it was going to be a UFO record. It wasn't going to be called Mong Way, even though they had previously released a record called Mogway with uh, this wonderful shredding guitar player, George Bellis. Right. And uh, to make a long story longer, as the record got close to being finished, they didn't, Phil didn't really want to get into a, you know, a, a legal battle with Michael over the name. Because I think in 1995, they did Walk on Water. They reunited with Michael and Phil and Michael both agreed that they would have to both be involved for it to be called UFO, right? So they had a falling out and then Phil just kind of let kind of, you know, linger and, and um, anyway, so we ended up deducing it to Mogway. Made me a little sad. I'm like, okay, it's supposed to be UFO. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite bands. Anyway, after that, um, I'm just going to kind of summarize quick. I produced the record with Phil, which was supposed to be a film log solo record, which ended up being a band called Sign of Four. And the record was really well received and was put on track records, which is the old label that um, Jimi Hendrix and Who were on back in the day. And it got revived by Ian, Ian Grant from... Uh, Big Country, the manager. And so that did well. And um, after that, Phil called me about doing a UFO record. He goes, I have the name. And I was really like, this is kind of an interesting gossip part of our podcast because there's a controversy, you know, like, did they ask me to join? Did I turn them down? It was kind of one of those things where he called me up and he said, actually, in Classic Rock Magazine, that Jeff didn't really seem interested. And what it was is we had vested so much interest in this band called Sign of Four, this new thing. It's like you just got married to whoever, Plan A, Plan B's over there. And then when he talked to me about doing that, I was like, wow. I thought we were doing this and I felt like we were cheating on ourselves. And then his manager called me and, and, you know, started suggesting other guitar players. And, but, you know, it was one of those things where I felt like it ran its course with Phil, you know, and, and Pete Wegg, rest in peace. He was kind of having a lot of problems with, you know, his ability to play and function in life and, so, but still to this day, you know, you get these fan forums, uh, you know, Jeff Coleman versus Vinnie Moore. And I'm like, Vinnie Moore is one of my dearest friends. And the guy's one of the greatest guitar players on planet earth. And I don't know why people have to compare. And they do it with Paul Chapman, you know, that era of UFO. They're like, what's better, Michael Shaker, Paul Chapman? <laughs> like, who cares? <laughs> it's like Sammy Hagar, David Lee Roth, who cares? It's music, you move on, has to evolve. So, you know, um, they ended up doing a UFO record with Vinny. Funny thing was, is Vinny called me, said, hey, what do you think? Should I join the band or not? And he didn't even know that Phil kind of maybe asked me or maybe didn't, I don't know. And I said, you know, you got to figure it out for yourself because, you know, it's a little dysfunctional pete way and but we'll see you know and you just have to make your own decision so but yeah 
but I'm really happy with the record and the, you know, the Mogway. It's really rocking. We have Simon Wright on drums from uh, ACDC and Barney James Dio and, and Paul Raymond on keys. And Paul, yeah. he's a legend, rest in peace. Right. I, well, it, it's a, it's a great record. And, and I think that that probably was what fueled fans, you know, wanting to know why you weren't in UFO, because I mean, it would have been great to hear what it would have sound like if you continued working with them after, after chocolate box. Yeah. You know, for me, I mean, um, having done those two records, it was enough for me. I mean, never for one day back then, it was more heartbreaking that it wasn't called UFO instead of Mogway. And then once that happened, I was like, okay, that's fine. And then we did the film Mog, you know, sign of four. But after that, I didn't feel like I need to join UFO, you know, mm-hmm. because it's a legacy band and, and they have stock in the band fill, you know, with all the records to be the new guy in the band really just, um, fills a void of insecurity that you need to be known with a famous band it'd be like if roger wallace calls me and says okay join pink floyd right now well what does that really mean maybe we do a record maybe we do a tour is it pink floyd is it not it's an ego boost it's something great to tell somebody at a at a dinner party (laughs) unless you're making 10 15 grand a week who gives a fuck? Because that was then. Yeah. It's a snapshot in time, you know? UFO was great. The record I made with Phil um, and Paul Raymond and Pete Way, the fans really dig it. And they're like, why isn't he the guitar player? Doesn't matter. I'm not the guitar player and I'm fine with it. Yeah. Like I did other things and traveled other places and it's wonderful. And Vinny's perfect for the band you know mm-hmm. so yeah people that get hung up on that stuff it's kind of weird <laughs> why is he not the guy why is he the guy you know it's just stupid yeah. really well i mean, I mean it's- if i'm being completely honest i love pete way but i couldn't function and with him in a band i couldn't i couldn't imagine being in a band with him touring and being functional so that that was kind of where I was going to go with my next question was was what what were the dynamics like in that band with with Phil and 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 Paul Raymond and and Pete Way and and you know they had this like reputation at least Phil and Pete did of you know really probably like overindulging quite a bit especially yeah. Pete I mean was it still like that when when you were working with them in 1999 it was um Pete was, um, he was really using a lot and um, he was so sweet and, but he was such a kind of uh, tortured soul, you know, uh, Phil was great. You know, he was drinking, I have a drink, I'm drunk right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Paul Raymond was, um, he was, you know, and I, I actually, I try never, never repeat anything on another podcast, but I'll say this that I said one other time is Paul Raymond came to me and he's a legend in my eyes, you know, the whole band. And he literally said to me, he goes, I've heard the demos and this is your and Phil's record. You guys are really having a moment and I just really want to compliment it. And so please let me know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. I'll just kind of add some, a little textures here and there. And, you know, at this point, I was 29 years old. I left Toledo, Ohio. I've never been in a famous band. And I have Paul Raymond saying that to me. So humble and cool. Where most guys might have went, hey, you know what, kid? Step aside. This is UFO. You better figure out how to, you know, it's like, it's like having a job somewhere. And you're like, okay, you better just fit in. And it was just the opposite. He was like, let me know how I can compliment the great songs that you and Phil have written together. And I was like, wow, I can't believe Paul Raymond. Uh, Unbelievable. And of course, everything he added was perfect. 
you know, he was just incredible. And Pete Way, he wrote uh, uh, Sparkling Wine and a couple other ones. You know, Pete's one of these guys, you can dismiss him because he's a little fucked up once in a while, but he comes up with great songs. He wrote Too Hot to Handle. And one of the best songs off Mogway is Sparkling Wine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so there you go. <laughs> After that, you also played uh, bass in the uh, in the MSG in the Michael Shanker band for, yeah. for a brief that period of time. That was actually part of that, yeah. So it all kind of like, yeah, because you obviously made some connections there. So how was it part of that? Uh, yeah, so that was a precursor to uh, joining uh, UFO and Mogway. And- oh, so this was before that? Yeah. Okay, okay. So what happened, I moved out of Toledo, Ohio. I had this band, Edwin Dare, and um, which I think is better than fucking Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. How about that? It sounds like I'm going to have to check it out. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone needs to check that out, I think, is how it sounds. Yeah, the record's called Can't Break Me. Put on any Judas Priest record or Iron Maiden and then get back to me after you listen to Can't Break Me. Um. Yeah, I was really passionate about that band. My brother was in that band, and but it's timing, you know. So with, with Michael Schenger, so I moved uh, to Phoenix on my way to LA and met Shane Gallus, who was playing drums with Michael. And Shane said, you know, you know, you want to do this tour with Uli Roth and Joe Satriani? I'm like, of course. I'm looking at the schedule. It's like Cardiff, you know, Edinburgh seven shows in France, Germany, Spain, Italy. I'm like, are we, I, I, you know, I've been on a plane like once in my life to audition for Alice Cooper when I was 18 years old. I didn't get the gig, lived in Toledo, Ohio, toured on a tour bus. And I'm looking at the schedule going, okay, number one, I didn't even know Uli Roth still exists because I haven't heard anything from him in like 10 years. And he's my fucking hero. And I'm going to be in Michael Schenker's band and playing with Joe Satriani, touring these countries, of course. You know, the funny story, because people love funny stories. So I was doing a session. Uh, I was kind of like became the session guitar player at the studio called Phase Four in Phoenix. It was like an A studio in Phoenix that was equivalent to like East West in L.A. or cello or one of these places and um, I became really close with the uh, engineer that was the house engineer and he says hey uh, Michael Schenker's coming in to do written in the sand guitar solos that was a solo record he was doing do you want to tech for him I'm like sure he goes yeah it pays like I don't know 100 bucks a day 200 bucks a day I don't care I would have done it for, I would have paid <laughs> to do it so it was Michael I and Ron Nevison now, this is prior to doing the G3 tour. And so Michael came in, he pulled up on his, you know, he had a white um, Mercedes convertible. And I just thought it was so cool. He had his guitar on his hat on backwards, still had blonde hair, laser beam blue eyes. And Ron Nevison, who looked like Ted Danson, he was the, he was the uh, engineer producer. And it's just the three of us in the studio for two days. I tuned Michael's guitars, hand to him. And he'd play a solo and Everson would go, maybe he's allowed to. What do you think, Jeff? I, oh, yeah, give me the guitar. And the funny story is, so two months later, Shane's like the drummer from Michael Shanker. He says, hey, you know, do you want to play bass? I'm like looking at the tour dates. Yeah, let's do it. And he goes, you know, Michael, if he knows you're a guitar player, instead of a bass player, he might not want to hire you. So just own it, act like you're the bass player. I go, well, actually I've met Michael a couple of times. We were in the studio together. And he goes, maybe don't even mention that. So when I meet Michael, he's looking at me, he goes, you look so familiar to me. <laughs> and he's like looking through me. I mean, he has this like, look, like kind of intimidating. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. I kind of played it off like I was, you know, eventually I owned up to, yeah, we were in the studio together. Oh, okay. But I already knew I had the gig by this time. So, you know, I had to kind of, you know, backpedal and downplay it. 
but that was kind of an interesting uh, dynamic to join in Michael, you know? So yeah, it's funny, funny story. <laughs> So, so what was that? I mean, going to bass and playing bass from guitar and playing with the Michael Shanker band. Do you consider that like was that overall a good experience for you? Was it? I mean, does yeah, it sound it as cool as? Yeah, it Fantastic. sounds like it's incredible. I mean, um, you know, I have the utmost respect for bass players, and uh, you know, playing with fingers is so like there's no learning curve for that. You know, I can play rock with the pick. You know, I could do like a Cliff, Cliff Williams ACDC bass, but to play like for Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, doing like a Motown thing, it's like, oh, you know, it's a whole nother animal. So the respect level, especially when you have like Ampeg SVTs behind you, and if you hit one wrong note, it's like the foundation has left you, you know, uh, it's pretty intimidating, so it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. How, how long did you uh, end up playing um, with Michael Shanker on tour? Uh, five weeks. Five weeks. Yeah. So to, who, who uh, came in and, and what, well, first, I guess the question is you were replacing somebody, right? Who, who could have played? Um, was it Barry Sparks? Uh, yeah. Barry Sparks. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he was unable to perform those five weeks or what was yeah, the story that, behind yeah. that? I think, you know, Barry's done a lot of gigs. He's always juggling like, <laughs> He's amazing, like all the all the gigs he's had, and um, he called me. I think he knew that I'm not going to be a guy that's going to try to steal his gig. Um, you know, I'm a guitar player and I'm comfortable doing that, and I'm just there to like show up and play the gig, then walk away. Yeah. Funny enough, he called me to play bass for UFO after I'd already worked with Phil playing guitar. Yeah, that was in. 2005 right you were yeah with I, you, uh, with jason bonham yeah. right and, and so so how was that experience actually playing in ufo and and playing yeah, bass wonderful. with them it was wonderful yeah yeah and you know i mean music is just fun and incredible and and vinnie and i are great friends and i remember one time backstage you know, it doesn't, it's not true, but he said, you know, the best guitar player in this band is actually playing the bass. He made one of these funny jokes. I'm like, Vinny, come on. I can't do what you can do. <laughs> but, you know, so we have this um, mutual respect for each other, you know. And uh, and then I, I came back and played with them in 2008 with, with um, Andy on drums, the original UFO drummer. And Andy's just, a, he's a gem. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how the family just continues, you know? Yeah. And, and then, then the other band that you're in right now, the uh, Cosmo Squad, you uh, it had features uh, Shane and Barry, who, well, Shane was with Michael Shanker and, and yeah. Barry, Barry was in, in Michael Shanker and, That's and also right. UFO for a, a yeah. little while too, right? Yeah. yeah. It's very incestuous. They yeah. They both Malmsteen and right. um, yeah. Famous Japanese band called The Bees. You yeah. played with the bees also? No, no. Oh, okay. Uh, Shane and Barry. Oh, play, right. Bees oh. is a uh, um, Koshi and Tak Matsumoto, and um, uh, the, so they were basically it's like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, and everybody else is a hired side man. And so when we formed Cosmo Squad and put out a record deal, uh, did a record deal with Japan we were on a, a label under the umbrella of their company. And when they were auditioning musicians, um, the a and rep referred Shane to audition for them. I mean, this band has sold more records than freaking Madonna, you know? Yeah. So of course it was like good for them to join that band. Right. So basically B stole my rhythm section. <laughs> But they were playing in front of 80,000 people a night, you know? Yeah. You really can't blame them. No, you can't blame them. No. So, so, <laughs> and so what... great, incredible band. I mean, and, you know, amazing. And the Japanese fans are incredible. And, yeah. Yeah. So Cosmo Squad released a, a song this year, correct? Um, did we? I, we I... put out, you know, the last studio record we did was in 20. 
17 called Morbid Tango. Mm-hmm. Uh, we re- re-released uh, a song, Jam for Jason. Right, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. 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 That was an old recording, and we had a revision on the guitar person that played on it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. What, what are the future plans for that? Do you uh, see yourself doing another record soon? Absolutely. Or touring? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's probably one of the most unique bands I've ever been in, you know, where we kind of just do what we do. We it's a melting pot of so many different styles of music and we've kind of created our own, you know, our own kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, musical stamp. I don't know. It's, it's very unique. It, it is. And, and I was, you know, I was trying to describe it. I was saying like, well, is it jazz fusion? I guess in a way it is, but I mean, there's so many other elements yeah. thrown in there. Yeah. I mean, if something's cool, you can't really um, categorize it. Categories are like whatever, you know? Yeah. To me, heavy metal is Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Queensryche. Name me another band. I go, well, that's a little more thrash metal. Well, that's a little more this. That's a little more that. These names get kind of weird after a while talk about early van halen metal i'm like it's not metal it's just sexy and it's awesome it's van halen it's actually it's his own thing you can't say what it is eddie van halen is just eddie van halen you know Mm -hmm. it's not classic rock because that sounds older than van halen was you know yeah it actually kind of uh defined what rock was or became at the time i mean because everybody was copying you know, Eddie right. Van Halen. So, right. you know, right. Van Halen became, or rock became the Van Halen sound almost. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, one of the other artists that you played with was uh, John Payne's Asia. Yep. Um, I, I remember uh, John Payne's Asia playing in, in the Buffalo area. They played a place called Batavia, Batavia Downs. They have a concert series every Friday. And it was in 2009, 2018. And I was looking forward to going to the show because I knew you were in the band, but you, right. you weren't there that day. And I was pretty pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, where was where's Jeff at? Coleman? You know, like waiting for him. Maybe he's coming on a little bit late. What is up right. with this? Right. Yeah. yeah so where was that show at? It was at Batavia Downs. It was, I think it was, it was 2018, probably like July or August. Okay. Yeah. You never know. I don't know. You sometimes, um, I'll sub out the gig, you know. I was probably playing with Alan Parsons. And so, uh, you know, I prioritized that show. Not that it's more important. It's just I'm a part of the band and, you know, we have a new record. And so we do that, you know. Mm-hmm. What, what was the exp- your experience with playing with John Payne? You know, uh, he's, he's a brother to me, man. He's like one of my dearest friends. And I've known him since I think 20... 2010 and um yeah i really enjoy um you know him personally the thing about music like what attracts you to play with somebody or not you have to be careful because some people choose gigs that maybe maybe it's the pay maybe it's the notoriety and then they're disappointed like I had a friend that used to play with Shakira and she's like, he's like, he's fucking nuts, you know, insane. And this gig, oh, he's fucking crazy. I'm like, why do it? <laughs> you know, but sometimes you don't know going in. And I remember thinking, you know, I like Asia's music, but I, I prefer yes. And I'm a fan of Steve Howe. But I remember taking the gig with him because I liked him more than anything else. I liked John Payne as a person and we really got along and it was easy, you know? And we were doing stuff that just, it was just fun hanging out. It's like when you meet a buddy and you go like, wow, I like this guy, he's cool, you know? Yeah. And it was nothing more than that. Do, do you see so- to him and he's like, yeah, I'm really, specific about my guitar players and I'm like I don't you know uh, I just do what I do and but well, we've got along great and we're still dear friends and I was just in a studio two weeks ago recording a record for a couple of days yeah so mm-hmm. great 
Wow. Um, so are you still uh, working with him or is... Yeah, we, we're doing shows. We're working on a new record. Okay. So and, you are... Okay. Yeah, and he was helping out uh, Eric Norlander, who was the uh, previous uh, keyboard player in Asia, who's... Um, he's producing a record for his wife, Lana Lane. So Lana Lane's doing a record. Eric's the producer. He decided to do it at John's studio in Vegas. And they hired me to play guitar. So in between recording with John with Asia, we did this record, you know, I think 11 tracks in two days. Wow. And she's an amazing singer. Sounds, you know, kind of like Ann Wilson from heart. Mm -hmm. Soulful. Wow, I'm looking forward to hearing that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're you're a pretty busy guy. Sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, to have to, to have the you know the, the chops that you have and, and the resume you have, I'm, I'm sure you get calls all the time. Yeah, you know, um, I've been fortunate just to play music for a living, you know. Yeah. And you know, one of my great joys of of the people that you didn't mention would be Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple. Yep, he's also on the list I have, yes. And I can't tell you how many wonderful memories with him and touring. And, you know, we go back to 2003, I think, 2002, you know. And we always reconnect like every five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have this thing, you know. I'm sure 2023 is going to call me. Okay, Coleman, this is what we're doing. <laughs> I hope so. I yeah. would love to hear that again yeah. yes yeah i, I want to go um back to like one of the things that you said earlier and and that's that you had auditioned for the alice cooper band was when you're what 18 you said yeah yeah well, well what was that experience like for you i mean 18 years old the audition for alice cooper i mean that that has to be pretty intimidating going into it it was um i had never been on a plane before so I live in Toledo, Ohio, and I had signed a deal with Cherry Lane Music and Cherry Lane Publishing, which was guitar for the practicing musician, uh, John Sticks, who's a you know, famous uh, writer, and he's interviewed Eddie Van Halen, everybody over the years. So that was like, to be a part of that family was amazing. And, um, you know, that was born out of me sending cassettes from Toledo, Ohio to magazines. Mike Varney, Shrapnel, Guitar for Pack Musician. You know, I remember sending stuff to EMI. They're like, yeah, we're not signing instrumental music, but we love your record. Could you send more, 10 more copies? I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, funny. So I got on a plane, went there. I think the studio was on Weddington Street. And they, you know, I went and auditioned. I remember kind of blanking on the songs. I walked in and it was um, Eric Singer on drums. I want to say Derek Sherinian on keys. I'm not sure who else was in the band. And Alice walked into the control room and said, he said, oh, why are you here? I said, I'm here to audition. He goes, oh, it's like going into the dentist office to get your teeth pulled. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> and uh, I walked into the room and we were doing like 18 Feed My Frankenstein, which is later like Al Petrelli played guitar on it. And, um, and they said, you know, you might, if you get the gig, are you willing to dye your hair black? Because I look like Sebastian Bach, long blonde hair. And I said, yeah, I'll do anything. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Just want to get out of Toledo. <laughs> anyway, nobody really got the gig. The guy who gave up the gig ended up coming back and doing the doing the gig, and the tour kind of fizzled out right away because it was the wrong time. You know, it was just pre grunge. I remember it was Alice Cooper, Judas Priest, and Megadeth, and it lasted like two and a half months. Then I think we had like the Gulf War or one of those, and. You know, ticket sales were low, and so it was kind of the end of it. But, you know, that was an era where, like, Rob Halford left Judas Priest. Um, Bruce Dickinson left Iron Maiden. And, and the bands that were big just kind of fizzled out, like Skid Row, Warrant, Cinderella. It was a change happening. So, you know, 
you know, I, I remember that. West. Yeah, I, re I remember that well. Yeah. So, so what did you end up doing after that with a different uh, music scene? You know, I moved west and started doing sessions and producing. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, that was probably the smartest thing you could do at that point yeah. if you weren't wearing flannel and yeah. from Seattle. Okay, so uh, Jeff, I want to uh, thank you very much for doing this interview. Um, I want to tell everybody out there that if you're looking for the ultimate Jeff Coleman release, and Jeff, please, please feel free to like, you know, add to this. But uh, I, I want to recommend that your new solo record, East of Heaven. And I also want to uh, recommend the Cosmo Squad uh, live at the Baked Potato as probably the, the two records that if you want to listen to this guy play, those are the two that you must listen to like immediately after watching this podcast. And is there anything that you want to ask that Jeff, what else could, could they listen to that you think is up there with those two? And, and first of all, do you agree with those two being pretty much, you know, two of the, the most representative of your playing? Releases? Well, um, you know, it's been a long career, so I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, the East of Heaven is a little more reflective. Live at the Baked Potato is live, and that's a that's a great choice, and it's received a lot of, uh, you know, positive feedback. Um, Shedding Skin, my solo record, which was uh, mastered and remastered in 2017, is uh, I think is the one that a lot of people say is kind of the record of, of solo record. And uh, I'm really proud of all the Cosmos Squad stuff. You know, the Morbid Tangos, Squadrophenia, all of that. And um, it's kind of blown up on Spotify. And, you know, I think we had like 600,000 hits in six months and, you know, wow. crazy. So, and if you're into lyrics um, and vocals, which we all are, uh, Sign of Four, with Phil Mog, or um, Mogway, you know. Yeah kind of records yeah i have records i sing on too um but it's kind of weird because <laughs> you know i'm more known as a guitar player it's weird the interesting thing is when i sing i kind of ignore my guitar playing yeah you because know, i'm so focused on the vocals so mm -hmm. it's it's a weird kind of you know some of those records people go well you should have shredded more i'm like yeah i was more interested in the lyrics and you know singing so it's about finding a balance. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Morbid Tango, Live at the Baked Potato, Sign of Four, Shedding Skin. Those are good records to check out. Yeah. And, and well, of course, the, the Mog Way record. I just assume that everybody already knows that. So that, that's why I didn't recommend that. Well, but, even yeah. UFO fans don't all know. You know, they're still talking about it on, uh, you know, threads. Like, oh, check this record out. Wow. I didn't even know that one. You know, the thing is, the world is so moving so fast these days that people, even UFO fans that are of that age demographic, that will even know Mogway, you know, so you never know. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm just a little bit too deep into it perhaps. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. Um, the, the very last question I have for you, Jeff, and thank you very much for your time that this oh, yeah. was a very interesting interview. Um, is uh, what do you still, what would you still like to accomplish in your career? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's really more the same. I just want to, I know that sounds like well, <laughs> anticlimactic. I mean, you could say, oh, I'd like to have a Grammy or be in the Rock and Roll of Fame, but I really don't respect either one of them. So <laughs> fuck them. Um, it's really about um, uh, just continuing to build a body of music and inspire people, you know, inspire young guitar players. And I, maybe there's an educational side that I want to embark on later on after touring. I don't know. Um, but really it's just about creating more and, and spreading the word of music and, you know, not just my music, but any music, music education, everything, you know, uh, really it's just a continuation mm -hmm. yeah all right well it sounds good all right so uh there he is everyone jeff coleman jeff thank you for being our guest it was a pleasure talking to you all right thank you so and, much and good luck out there and knock him dead and keep kicking yeah. ass all right all right all right cheers thank you so much right. take it easy jeff all right bye-bye bye-bye